Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the talk about alpine flowers of Britain and Europe. Sorry for the delay. Um, as I was looking through my records of photographs, which I use for my website, uh, I was quite surprised to find that I appear to be um, an alpine enthusiast. Because whenever we've gone on holiday, I always seem to find some time where I can get into the hills and the mountains. Whether we've gone there deliberately to see the plants or whether we've gone to somewhere else, I always seem to go there. So I had a huge number of slides uh, to choose from. And to start with, really, I thought it would be worthwhile just having a look at the sorts of places you can find alpines in Britain and Europe. And you could be surprised to find that they are many and varied. So here's the first slide. Um, and you should now have a picture of Pete Snyder at 10,000 feet. Is that on, Janet? It is. It is. Um, this is just testing that the slides are actually working. Well, at 10,000 feet, we're only about 1,000 feet below the level where you're expected to check for altitude sickness. That's how high you are. And when we got out of the, uh, the funicular to get here, we were greeted with lots of snow, rocks, and absolutely nothing growing in front of us whatsoever. The only clue that there actually might be something worth seeing was in the middle distance, where there appeared to be, appeared to be a group of people with what I would call botanist stoop. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But if you go 2,000 feet below this, all of a sudden it changes dramatically. And what you actually get is the typical rolling Swiss uh, uh, countryside with grassy slopes covered in wildflowers. And although some of them, yes, can be found in the lowlands, an awful lot of the ones that you're just um, seeing around you are actually alpines. And this, at 8,000 feet, of course, is twice the height of Ben Nevis. I'll probably mention that quite a lot because Ben Nevis is sort of my uh, metric for deciding how high something is. In the Pyrenees, in Andorra, we're at 6,300 feet, and you can drive to these sorts of places, get out of the car and wander, and here you've got all kinds of uh, plants in the middle ground there, including Alpen Rose. But if you were to go to the Austrian Tyrol, although the the really good ski slopes are always well served by uh, cable cars and, and funiculars. In the Wilderkaiser, it's much more like Britain because there aren't any good ski slopes here. So there's no uh, way up except by the British method of climbing up yourself. And of course, it takes an awful long time. So if you want to enjoy your apple strudel at the Grüttenhütte, then you must make sure that your climbing starts around about eight o'clock in the morning. But on the way up, you'll see whole loads and loads of alpines. And here we are back now in Britain, standing at the top of one of the Scottish uh, famous alpine mountains, Ben Laws. Uh, in the foreground there, you can see Anne Stuck, the conical mountain, which has recently been added to the list of uh, 284 Munros with Loch and Nancat, uh, there, the little lake there. And the reason why we're up here is because we're quite close to one of the iconic Arctic alpines that people always want to see on Ben Laws, and I'll show it you later. And so from Scotland, the heights of about 4,000 feet, actually it's only about 3,996, the height of Ben Laws, but what they did was to make the trig height particularly tall. So the very top of it was, at four, uh, was at actually at, at 4,000 feet. And so to England, and I have to say, if you're an alpine enthusiast, England's a real disappointment. Because uh, quite frankly, until you get to the north of England, into the Lake District and Northern Pennines, our hills are just too small. But there are some places where the climate is uh, such that you can get alpines growing. So you can, if you go to Teesdale, for instance, uh, see one or two alpines growing at low levels. Uh, simply because of, of the uh, famous uh, sort of alpine climate that there is in Teesdale. And in, uh, in Wales, Snowdonia, this is one of the ones I would always recommend if you are starting out on your first um, attempt to gather some alpine flowers, this is the place to go to. Snowdon Snowdonia, Cumidwal, it's only 1,600 feet, which is a boon to anybody who wants to take uh, a party up there because you don't need an amount of leadership certificate to go on that, what looks like a huge landslide of rocks. It looks as though it happened only a year or so ago, but actually it's been there for thousands of years. And all of those rocks, there are many, many different kinds, 
of alpine plants growing. So you could get a good collection if you were to stay in Kuminwal all day long. And finally, and this is perhaps a surprise to many, uh, northwestern Scotland is so far north, we're on, the nor we're on the north coast now, that you actually do get some alpines coming down to sea level. Um, and an example of that would be at Betty Hill, where you can find uh, magnificent plants of a plant which otherwise uh, grows in the mountains in Scotland, but at Betty Hill is only a few heat feet um, above sea level. And this is Oxytropis halleri, the purple Oxytropis. Uh, there are lots of little plants at Betty Hill, but you have to know where the big ones are. Going back to that um, uh, picture of the Bernina Alps in Switzerland, there's a group luxuriating in the Swiss flowers there. What were they looking at? Well, a close up here and you can see uh, forget-me-nots in the far ground there, those will be Myosotis alpestris, and what looks like to me some horn violets and, vi and buttercups in the foreground. So those are the sorts of places you can find alpines, which means you can actually below, be just below the height where you might get altitude sickness, and in the northern Scotland, you could be just out of your car by the side of the road. But alpines have become very popular with the, pu the public as a whole, so um, I doubt that you could go to any nursery or garden centre and not find a section somewhere of little plants. And when you look amongst them, you find there are many, many of those that are alpines from Britain and Europe. So I would suspect that any person who hasn't actually done any alpine hunting will know some of the ones I'm actually going to show you. And I'd be very surprised if you didn't recognise this one, which is, of course, Aubretia. And I wonder if you knew that Aubretia actually grows in the White Mountains of Crete, cascading over the rocks, just like it does on your rockeries, at 4,100 feet. In the Swiss Alps, where the uh, glaciers have receded a little bit, you can find the spectacular Icelandic poppy, now called Papava crocium, we used to be called Nudicoli, um, and it stands out easily, easy to find, because it's so vivid, and because of that, um, it's very often on sale in garden centres and you can, it will actually grow in your garden. Um, it's not one of those fussy alpines that only wants to grow at many thousands of feet high. And it's not only yellow, you get the orange, you can get vivid yellow ones as well. And they're exactly the same species. If you were going for a walk in the uh, Pyrenean area, um, you might find something that you recognise and deduced that you were looking at the ordinary columbine, but looking at it closer, you would see it was a bit taller, the bells were a bit larger, the whole of the flower was a little bit larger, and this turns out to be an, a sort of Pyrenean alpine version of our ordinary columbine, Aquilegia vulgaris, and this is Aquilegia pyrenaica, the Pyrenean columbine, columbine. But it's one of those where immediately you saw it, you would probably recognize it for what it was and just need to look up which species it is. Similarly, um, if you go walking these days, actually, in certain parts of the southern England, uh, examples of Thurfield Thir Thir Heath and the Devil's Dyke, you might come across this beautiful flower, the Pasque flower, Pulsatilla vulgaris. Much reduced in numbers, but you do get them in, in, uh, in large displays. And I think on one of our Facebook pages, uh, one of our members, Nicola Hawkins, has actually put some lovely pictures uh, from Thurfield Heath. Is there a relation? In the hills? Well, you bet there is. And here it is, the alpine pasque flower. And even though the conditions are much harsher in the hills, it, it really grows in profusion. And you can actually find this covering the side of a hillside um, with this alpine pasque flower, Pulsatilla alpina. That one, I, whenever I see it, I always gaze at it, try and photograph it, try and get a, a better picture. And it, it really is a photogenic. Uh, which is can't really be said for this next one, which arguably is our most famous wildflower of all. Because this, ladies and gentlemen, is Idlevice. Famous because, of course, it's got a song about it. But let me br be brutally frank as an alpinophile. It's a bit dull, really, isn't it? It's nice and fluffy and very interesting. And uh, you always want to know that you've seen it. But it's not one that you would want to take home and put in a vase. In our lowland areas, we get Primula vulgaris, the ordinary primrose, and in the, um, in the uh, hills as well, 
you can find relatives of the primula. A lot of them are sort of purply in colour, and this is a good example of it, primula hirsuta, um, and they grow sometimes singly like this in little clumps, and sometimes they grow in bigger sheets, and I'll show you some of those later. We do have uh, one or two sites, though, for a quite reasonably common alpine in Europe. Um, we've got a couple of sites in Britain, one in the Lake District and at least one in Scotland of alpine catchfly, which is this one. I have seen it in the Lake District, but it's one of those where you really do have to spend a lot of time searching for it and finding it, and it's, it's very difficult indeed. Much easier to see in, in, uh, in European areas is the common house leek. Uh, typically growing on bare rocks like this, uh, not just Semphivima montanum, but some of its relations are, are to be found in many of the mountain and alpine areas. And uh, you, I would be very, very surprised if you went to an alpine on an alpine walk and came across some rocky areas and didn't find at least one example of this. So it is actually quite common. But one of the plants that people tend to look out for, if you like the alpine enthusiasts anyway, uh, are members of the Andrasaces. And this one is uh, Andrasacea carnea, the pink rock, rock jasmine. And it's always a pleasure to find those. And they really do uh, grow in, at height. But I've seen those on sale in, in on garden centres, not necessarily this species. And you can grow them in your garden. And so to having a look at some of the flowers, this is about alpines. So when better to start than in the Alps? And access is pretty cheap um, by the funiculars. Uh, at the, one of the hotels that we stayed at, they actually issued us with passes that made the, the um, access by any of the funiculars or cable cars free for the whole of the time that we were actually there. So as long as you got there um, on time and got up there in, in, in your group, you could, you could get right, right up into the areas of the uh, Alpines without actually exhausting yourself. And this is what you would find if you went right to the top of that place I show you at the first slide, Pete's Nair at 10,000 feet. No soil at all, only rocks, and dotted all about uh, these alpine plants. Immediately, if you like, telling you one of the features of alpines, they're very, very good at coping with any weather. It doesn't matter if the temperature goes really low, it doesn't matter if they're going to be covered in snow and ice in winter. What really matters to them is that they're not uh, they, they don't suffer any competition from lowland plants, which are usually a lot more vigorous. So this is, this really awful sort of ground is absolutely ideal. And you can sometimes get lovely clusters of uh, alpine plants like this, which has got a little bit of the, uh, the blue one, I'll talk about that later, and uh, a saxifrage and what looks like moss campion at the same time. And if you're very lucky, nestling in the rocks with no soil whatsoever, you can find a beautiful example of an Androsaceae, and this is Androsaceae alpina, the alpine rock jasmine. But a lot of people go to the Alps, they want to see one plant, which uh, is, if you like, famous, because it's actually called King of the Alps. It's a relative of the forget-me-nots, and it's Eritricum nanum, and this is it. Again, growing in desperately poor soil, um, well, no soil at all, a little bit of grass at one end, and it's got its own alpine weed growing amongst it, which looks like a little bit of a glacial buttercup. But that's one of the famous plants there, and uh, you saw all those little blue plants at the slide that I showed at the beginning were Eritricium nanum. If you go down 2,000 or 3,000 feet here, you do find um, plants which are uh, very common in nurseries and garden centres, and I have seen quite a few of these in full flower in the gardens on the lane where I live. This is Saponaria ossimoides, and yes, it's an alpine, but it will also grow at low levels. Not so much this next one that I'm going to show you though. I don't think I've seen much of this on sale in many garden centers and nurseries. And this one is actually spectacular. The GM reptans, reptans the creeping avens, grows in just typically this sort of place, growing from underneath the rock um, with these bright yellow flowers, uh, which make it stand out in the background. But if you're going to go to this sort of country, one of the things you'll definitely see an awful lot of are saxifrages of different kind. 
which is good. We like to see saxophrages, but I don't know whether you've seen um, uh, seen them in such numbers that of them look at this whitish or yellowish colour. And you have to look very, very carefully to identify them. Fortunately, we had a botanical leader with us, so he was able to tell me that this one was Saxifraga exorata, the white musky saxifrage. But otherwise, you might well need one of those um, specialist uh, books. There is a specialist saxifrage book which would help you to identify them, because when you're in this sort of country, you'll see many of them. At a much lower height, amongst the grassy slopes, of say like the Bernina uh, uplands, you'll come across these absolutely spectacular and unmistakable plants that uh, the uh, Swiss rolling countryside is famous for. This is Gentiana lutea, the great yellow gentian. And uh, I, I don't know what makes it so attractive, but when I came to it at first, it was absolutely covered in little black insects. And that's at Val de Fane in the Swiss Alps. Not very far from there, many relatives of our own primrose, this is Primula latifolia, the viscid primrose, about nine inches to 12 inches tall, um, but you can get much lower growing ones growing in uh, huge numbers, uh, Primula integrifolia, the entire leaf primrose, growing in literally hundreds and thousands all at once. One of the things you do find in these high areas now is a rather depressing indication of how climate change has altered the environment. And here we have an example. This is the Mortaratch Glacier in the um, Bernina Alps. And they very kindly put uh, notices at different places where the glacier was at different, uh, different times. So you can be really surprised to find that there's a notice actually in what you use as a car park. And in the 1920s, that's where the glacier was but it's retreated now right into the hills. And as it's retreated, of course, the plants have come up behind and taken over. So from the botanist's point of view, it's very interesting to walk towards the glacier, looking at the sorts of um, plants that you see. And one that really fascinated me was this one. This is the snow gentian, Gentia nivalis, which I'm quite familiar with because it grows in Scottish mountains. But here, it's a good example of why you can't always take the shapes of flowers for granted that you see in books because it looked hugely different uh, in um, the wake of this glacier. Uh, it was about six inches tall and all the petals were much narrower than we see them uh, when we see them in the Scottish Highlands. So my first reaction was that I didn't know what it was at all and then when the Arlene said well it is actually the snow gentian that reminded me things do grow differently in different environments. Fortunately though the serrated wintergreen looks exactly the same as the one in Scotland. And that too is a good find if you find it in, in our country. And, uh, uh, and it was a good find there as well. Surprisingly, um, if you are going for a walk in one of the Swiss towns and you do know a little bit about alpine botany, um, you obviously are going to look at the plants that grow by the side of the road. And a good 50% of them are alpines and not more than, I would say, 200 yards from the main road in Pontresina, which is around about 5,000 feet, I found a, a lovely clump of the twin flower, which was Carl Linnaeus's favourite, so it's called Linnaea borealis, um, growing on a tree stump in dappled shade. And by the river that was nearby, something that immediately, I, I didn't know what it was, but I immediately recognised it as a willow herb from the shape of the flowers, and this turned out to be Epilobium flasheri the alpine willow herb, and typically it grows amongst the rocks by uh, streams. One of the most famous alpines, though, is Soldanella alpina, um, often seen actually flowering with its feet in the snow and its, its, its bells in full flower. Uh, and this one here, Soldanella alpina, was on the Austrian Tyrol. But the one on the, on the right-hand side is not to scale, I'm afraid. I didn't, I didn't do that correctly. And so Soldanella pusilla is actually a small one, the dwarf snowbell, and is a lot, lot smaller. So there we've got some of the, uh, some of the plants that you can get in the Alps, and it's time now to go and see what you can find in England. Well, the answer is not much. The thing is, it's 
England is too warm, too south. You can find, there are some places, but what I'm going to mention here is there are two places that are, uh, do have uh, um, uh, alpines in them, but for odd climactic reasons, in the Burren and in Teesdale, you can find things growing at a relatively low height. And this is an example, Gentiana verna, which is very common in the European mountains, uh, but will will you can actually find uh, growing at much much lower levels in uh, in both the Burren and Teesdale, and it will be in flower now, I think. Yes, and by the right banks of the River Tees, if you know where to look, you might very if you are very lucky uh, see some Bartia alpina. The triple R, by the way, is taken from Stace. It means it's very very rare, and this is Bartia alpina taken from the Teesdale. Um, and that too is very rare. If somebody said, oh, it's over there on the banks and uh, you went to search for it, honestly, without a guide, you, you would probably not easily be able to find it. There isn't very much of it there at all. In contrast to the European areas where there can be so much of it that you can actually sometimes find yourself treading on it. It really is very common indeed. In the Northern Pennines, um, uh, and you go up into the hills there, uh, you can see an awful lot of what look like buttercups. But when you get close to them, you see that they've got this wonderful speckled, uh, orange speckled view. And this is one of our rare saxifrages, Saxifraga herculus, which is a triple R. Um, and all over those hills too, at roughly about the same time, the whole hills will often turn white with Saxifraga hypnoides, the mossy saxifrage. But I wouldn't really call that an alpine. It grows at quite low levels in Derbyshire and other places but I'm struggling to find good examples of uh, places where you can find plenty of alpines in England because really there aren't that many. You could climb Helvellyn and go to Nethermost Cove and you'd find the odd one or two there. They would be genuine alpines, but you'd be, not, you'd be using an awful lot of energy for not very much alpine return. And so to Wales. Now I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this because I covered an awful lot of the flowers about Snowdonia and Cumidwal in my talk about finding the Snowdon lily. So if you want to know the detail, that's the video to have a look at. But I mentioned earlier that you can go walking in this spot, this looks like a huge landfall there, and find plenty of um, flowers such as, well, this is a fern, Cryptogramma crisper, with its fertile and non-fertile fronds, and that's all over the place, you can't miss it. But you certainly can miss this one, which is the Saxifraga sespitosa, tufted saxifrage. It used to grow amongst those rocks, but as climate change has taken a hold, it's now receded up into the hills and takes some finding. But I've seen photographs on the various Facebook pages in the last couple of years. It is still there, but you wonder how long it will survive for. On Snowdonia, we have Arabidopsis petraea still surviving in its most southerly station. This is Northern Rockcrest. And it's a double R just at this particular site. But when people go to Snowdonia, what they're really looking for is the Snowdonia speciality, which is, of course, Gagea serotina, which used to be called Lloydia serotina, the Snowdon lily. And the Snowdon lily, too, is another example of one that's very rare, hard to find. You've got to, to put a big effort in to go and find it. It only grows on ledges in certain places in Snowdonia. And it's as common as muck on the continents. So you can find it in fields, you can find it on rock ledges. You, will, you should easily be able to find Snowden lily on the continent. So, and so finally to Scotland. And you perhaps aren't surprised that I've left this one till now because this is where you would have the most fruitful expeditions to see alpines if you were going to find them. And in a sense, there are two kinds of places that there are mountains with specialities and there are mountains that simply have got a lot of uh, alpines. And if there's one place in the whole of this country that I would recommend you going to, um, it's Ben Laws, because in that small place um, around the foot of the Corrie between Ben Laws and Ben Glass, um, you've got huge numbers of alpines, more than anywhere else in the country. And this is actually the Corrie that I'm talking about. On the right hand side is the Ben Laws Corrie. And if you look at the path here leading up to this mountain, that mountain there is Ben Glass at about 3,500 feet. And Ben Laws is up this way. So you've got to climb all the way up there to the 4,000 feet peak. But a lot of the alpines are down here. 
It's just that there's one or two specialities right at the top. So if, you, um, if you're going to this uh, site to find the alpines, um, you've got to uh, think about it very carefully. The thing about these sorts of places is they're really quite high and generally speaking, the weather's rubbish. So uh, what we do in the Wildflower Society, we've got no choice. We do it exactly the wrong way. We choose a date and we say, we're going to go to Ben and Laws, look at the flowers on July the 12th or when it happens to be. But that's not the way um, you should really do it. The ideal way is to go to Scotland for a holiday, earmark, I don't know, three or four or five days when you might go up the mountain and choose the day when the weather's nice. Because if you go up when the weather's a bit miserable, it's very often drizzly and misty, honestly, you'll see very little at all. There are some flowers that don't come out. And even the ones that are out are all droopy and miserable and wet. And you'll be the same. But on the, uh, on the days when, it's, when, when the sun is out, it's absolutely brilliant. It is one of those glorious experiences. There's really not much in between. And to get here, of course, I'm pointing out this is Ben Glass. Where's the car park? Well, way over the other side. So you've either got to climb right over the top of Ben Glass or go all the way around it to get to this place. It's a slog. Is it worth it? You bet it is. Absolutely brilliant. But there are some that are easy to find on your way, on your way up. And this is the first one, Alcamilla alpina. And they're actually easy to identify too, because the leaves on Alcamilla alpina really don't look like much else except for a hybrid, which is sometimes it escapes into the wild um, and, uh, and you find one or two places here. But uh, you find this in the Lake Districts as well, by the way, but uh, it's all over the place. You, you literally cannot miss it. You'll be walking on it, Alcapilla alpina. And once you get to a reasonable height, you should also find the alpine mousia, Cerastium alpinum. And once it's started to appear, it's there all the time you see it. In fact, I have found alpine uh, I found alpine mouse here within three feet of the summit of Ben Laws. Ben Laws is made of a mica schist rock, which decomposes and crumbles very easily into a tremendously nutrient uh, soil. And that means to say that unlike most of the mountains, there's a nutrient soil all the way to the summit. So there are flowers and grass all the way to the summit on Ben Laws. And another one, uh, which you should easily find, Saxifraga azoides, yellow mountain saxifrage, um, not only is this and all the flushes on the way up uh, to, to the quarry where you've been hunting your, um, your, uh, your alpines, uh, it's also at the side of the road on the way to the village that's closest to Ben Laws. That village is called Killin. And as you come along the roads there, if you keep your eyes open, in all the wet bits at the side of the road, you can see Yellow Mountain Saxifrage. But if you get up there at the right time, you've got a very good chance of seeing uh, alpines to start off with, like Silenia acaulis, the moss campion. Uh, again, it's got quite bright pink flowers. It, 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 it grows in a tuft, and so it sort of stands out. Um, and this is now flowering on Ben Laws in mid-July. I have to mention that because the flowering times are going to be completely different depending on which part of the, if, like, the alpine scenery you're hunting in. If you're in uh, Snowdonia at Kumidwal, it's flowering in May, but here on Ben Laws, it's flowering in mid-July. Similarly, this, which is not nowhere near as spectacular, you'd have, perhaps have to hunt a little bit, but the mountain sorrel on the cliffs there is, found, is, is flowering in mid-July, but is flowering in May in, in Wales. One of the uh, violets that we're very used to seeing, both in Derbyshire and in, uh, in Northern Pennines, is Viola lutea. And strictly speaking, lutea means yellow, and many of them are yellow or variations on yellow. Uh, and the ones on Ben Laws, completely different. They're all blue with a yellow center, and they really do stand out. So Viola lutea is in flower I'm, uh, by mid-July, and it, even though uh, it, it's quite a dark blue, and it stands out from the blue of Myosotis alpestris, the alpine forget-me-not, which here on Ben Laws really grows luxuriantly. It's, it's six to nine inches tall, sometimes even a foot. Um, and it has these beautiful um, uh, forget-me-not flowers, such that really you look at it and you think, well, really, I'm sure, I'm sure I've got some of that stuff in my garden. Well, you've got a close relative, but not this one. The other interesting thing about it is that if you look very carefully in the, um, in the turf, close to the cliffs and in the cliffs themselves, you can find tiny ones, 
ones in flower that are less than one centimeter tall. And I mention that because those also, those tiny ones, only one centimeter tall, grow in the Northern Pennines. And they, they are both blue and also they're a vivid pink color as well. Although you should be able to find it, you will have to hunt for this next one, which is a close relative of a plant that many people are familiar with. Um, and the subspecies we're familiar with is Veronica serpilifolia, subspecies serpilifolia, the thyme-leaved speedwell. This one's a bit chunkier, but it's still quite small. If you look at the photograph, you can see the size of the grass leaves by the side of it. You can see that you've really got to hunt around to find uh, this one, but it's there. And if you look and, and persist, you should really be able to find it. On the cliffs of Ben Laws is one of our prettiest willows. And that's not something you normally say about a willow tree, but we have here the net leaved willow with its beautiful leaves. And in mid July, it's also in flower as well. And it never grows to any great height, but uh, it can be a small shrub. And here it is uh, quite a, a small plant growing out of the rocks of the cliff. Now, the next thing I really need to mention for all those people who are uh, interested in going to this famous mountain is there's some, what for me is disconcerting advice about what time to go. People will often say, well, go end of July, August, that time. Yeah, you can if you want, and you'll see plenty of stuff, but you'll miss a whole load because on Ben Laws, there are some flowers which will start to grow very rapidly as soon as the snow has melted in early May. And they really do get on with it and they start to flower quite early and by mid-July they're actually towards the end of their flowering period and that's why I always suggest if you're going to go there if you want to catch the end of the earlies and the beginning of the lates go mid-July and here's an example what used to be called Minuatia rubella Sabulina rubella is a very rare plant the mountain sandwort but by August it's completely finished and it's jolly difficult to find anyway, it's quite small, um, but it has these white flowers um, growing on the cliffs of the Corrie. Much easier to find as long as it's in flower is arguably our most beautiful speedwell, and that is Veronica fruticans, the rock speedwell, with its sort of uh, purpley red eye. Again, that one uh, doesn't have huge numbers of flowers on it, but uh, it does flower early. So if you're actually getting, if you actually get there um, after mid-July, you've got a good chance of not seeing it at all, even though you hunt all over the cliffs. Um, and that also goes for the older plants of Alpine Sankfoil, Potentilla crantii. And there are some well-established plants on the cliffs there that will have 20 to 30 flowers on them. And they really are very, very spectacular in the Alpine sunshine. Uh, Fortunately, you can actually also find some much younger plants which will flower a little bit later. But if you want to see the full glory of Potentilla crantii, you need to make sure you're there at the latest in mid-July. And so once you're there, you're now in what I would now call main crop country. And as long as the sun is out, you could find uh, Gentiana nivalis at the foot of the cliffs, snow gentian. And as you can probably see, much, much smaller and with wider petals than the one that I showed you from the Mortarach Glacier. The interesting thing I found about this was something I didn't know until um, something like my ninth expedition up uh, Ben Laws, uh, where I'd been telling my daughter about what a great place Ben Laws was, and so she insisted I took her up. We went up to the top and there were some people hunting. We don't usually find anybody in the colliery, but there were some people there. And we introduced ourselves and they said, do you know where the snow gentian grows? I said, well, it actually grows all around here. But if it's not actually in flower, it's going to be very difficult to find indeed. It's so well camouflaged. And at, the mo at that moment, there was a bit of cloud color cover. But as we were speaking, the clouds broke, the sun came out, so we carried on hunting. And within five minutes, uh, one of this other party had said, I've got something with a bit of blue in it here. So we went over and said, yeah, that is a gentian beginning to unfurl. With another five minutes, somebody said, I've got one out fully here. We went to see it, it was fully out. And to my great surprise, what I discovered was, if the sun comes out in mid-July, gentiana nivalis will flower within half an hour. That's all it takes to actually come out. 
which is good because uh, it really needs to do that. It's our only annual gentian. It needs to attract what pollinators there are, set seed and uh, produce the seed ready for the next year. On the high ledges of Ben Laws, you can find Erigeron borealis. And I don't know whether it's my luck, but I always seem to find a very nice specimen of Erigeron borealis growing one and a half feet above the top of my head, which means then that you should perhaps climb up the cliffs. But as I mentioned before, the rock there is mica schist and it's not actually terribly safe for climbing up. Not that that ever stops any of us, mind, but it's always worth looking at the base of the cliff. Because this is a very crumbly rock, during the winter with the snow and the ice, often it brings down some of the uh, flowers that were on the upper ledges down to the bottom of the cliff. And you can sometimes find a good quality alpine fleabane growing right at the bottom, uh, ready to be photographed. So that's just a sample. I can't really show you more. There's still many, many other alpines growing around this area. Um, uh, but let's now go to the top of Ben Laws. That was easy, wasn't it? We've just come to the top. We're at 4,000 feet and we're looking south. And the reason we're looking south is we're looking to these rocks over here because in those rocks, grows one of the uh, specialist plants that many, many people like to see. And I think there was an article in our Wildflower Society magazine about how somebody was desperately to see this and actually it made their day because this is one of the plants they actually saw. And I'm talking about the drooping saxifrage, Saxifraga kernua. And this is it. If you're wondering where the flowers are, well, most of the time it doesn't flower. It only produces these red bulbils. And because of that, it's actually one of our uh, exceptional plants in the Wildflower Society diary. You're allowed to count Saxifraga kernua only with bulbils on. I've actually seen it with flowers twice, but most of the time I just see these thick, the glossy leaves with the bulbils. It's one of those where you say, well, it isn't really spectacular, but it really is interesting that you've actually got all that way to see it because it's so famous. Well, that concludes, if you like, my whistle-stop tour of Ben Laws. But there are other mountains in Scotland which are what I would call specialists. They've got, they've got uh, alp alpines on them, but there's usually one plant which everybody wants to see. And such an example is on Cull Moor um, at 2,785 feet. It's reasonably high, um, but what you will have to do to get there is you must go over one small hill then you've got to go up Colmore, and the plant that you really want to see is on the other side. And all these mountains in this particular area are actually on the coast. So as soon as you get to the top, you're looking out to sea. On your way up, you might be lucky enough to find this. This for me was actually a, a really great find because I had actually seen the special plant on one occasion beforehand, but I'd never seen this. The alpine hawkweed, Hyracium alpinum, is the first alpine, is the first hawkweed that I was able to identify on my own and it was confirmed by Tim Rich. But here's the point, we've now got these wonderful books on uh, Hyracea which enable you to do it. And the alpine, the one about alpine hawkweeds helps me no end. So it was pretty straightforward to narrow it down. So that one was uh, at, the, at the foot of Colmore. And as we went up, we found commoner uh, and alpine plants like the uh, three-leaved rush, Drunkus crividus, crividus, which is rare. Um, and one that I always look for, for, for myself, which is uh, a juniper. And it always gives you the impression that the wind has blown it over. But actually, Juniperus communis subspecies nana likes to lie flat to the ground like this. And that is exactly how it grows. It's a procumbent juniper. But on this mountain, we've come for one particular speciality, and uh, if you're going there, go with botanists who are really keen. Because if you take somebody who's not a botanist, they'll have slogged all around the bottom of a mountain, all the way up to the top. You've then got to go down the other side. You've got to look in this moon moonscape. And when you get there, you will point to the flower and your friend will inevitably say, have we come all the way for that? Because it really isn't one of the most spectacular plants you'll ever see. But it is rather special because it only grows on a couple of mountains in Scotland. The rest of the time, you'll have to go to much more northern countries to see it. But that's not where the story ends for Culmore, because this being a mountain uh, right next to the sea, 
means there's something they tend not to tell you about in any of the travel details of the glorious places to see in Scotland, because the views from the top of ben of, of Colmore are absolutely spectacular. There's nothing like them. This is the view going looking out to sea, and in the in the distance over there, we've got the cooling on sky. If you look into the hinterland here, you can see numerous peaks of all kinds of Munros. And the last time I was up there, I went with a, um, a chap I've just recently been introduced to, and we stood by the side just gazing at this in this wonderful day. And I said, I wish I knew what these were called. And he said, which one? Uh, so I said, uh, well, what about that one? And he told me the name. I said, well, what about this one? He told me the name. What about that one? He told me the name. I said, you, you've been up all these, haven't you? He said, yes. I said, you've done all the Munros, haven't you? Yes, he said, five times. So he'd actually been up all 284 Munros in Scotland uh, five times. No wonder he knew all these peaks. But what a wonderful view it was. And closer to hand, a view of the very famous Stack Polly uh, saluted against the, uh, the sea. And on the other side, another famous mountain, Sylvan from Colmore, with a loch down at the bottom and the sea in the background. The photography doesn't really do it justice. It's absolutely wonderful. It's worth going up there just for the views and the various travelogues really uh, don't have these because those photographers can never be bothered to flog up to the top of um, Colmore to take the pictures. So that's one specialist mountain. And here's one that's much harder to go up. This is the summit of Frère Bain. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but uh, at the very summit is a special flower that only grows on this one mountain and it grows at the summit itself. And before we went on this expedition, I had to get instructions from my friends and they said, get right to the very top, right to the summit, look north, take 12 paces and you see a very large rock. On the north side of that rock is where the diapensia grows. So that's what we were aiming for. And uh, we gave ourselves three days to choose the best day to go up. And when we started, uh, the cloud base was probably about 2000 feet. But this isn't a mountain that really attracts many visitors. There's only this one special flower growing on it and not many birders go up either. So there are no paths. So you're just climbing from this bog to that bog over that tussock over this tussock. It's really, really hard going, even though it's not Munro, one of the hardest mountains I've had to climb. And also, you've got very little chance of finding the thing in flower because it flowers at the end of May. Now, bear in mind that on many Scottish mountains, the snow is lying there until the beginning of May. And if it's in a bad year, it's in, it's in the middle of May. And that means to say, really, um, the weather's likely to be very poor. It, it, May is not a good month for climbing uh, Scottish mountains. If you're a botanist, there's not much out, and it's very likely to be misty, drizzly, wet, or whatever. So choosing the three days, we chose the best of the, those. And um, with, our, with some hopes, we set out. Knowing that it was going to take us quite a long time to get there, it, you, the experience of those amongst us knew that as you climb and the day wears on, the cloud base usually lifts. And it did as we went on. And the uh, party strung out after a while. And uh, I was really in the rear because I was taking photographs of whatever I could on the way up, uh, just so I got some record in case we saw nothing at all. And as I got within 100 feet of the top, the clouds parted and the sun came out. And within just a few minutes of that, there were shrieks of delight I could hear because people had found diapensia. And when I got up to the top to that plateau, I didn't need those instructions of the 12 paces in the rock. It was absolutely everywhere. There were thousands of tufts of this plant at the very top. At the very top of this mountain, it's, ex it's exceedingly rare in the country, but it doesn't look endangered at the top. There's so much of it there. But it's growing on these silicaceous rocks. And as you go up to it, uh, you don't see much because it's too early in the year. So this is Vaccinium oliginosum in very tight bud. Um, but there are one or two plants here, Calmia procumbens. If there aren't any flowers on it, though, 
it can be a bit confusing for botanists that are looking for diapensia because the leaves look almost exactly the same. And the way that you tell the difference is because this has got pink flowers on, the other one's got yellow flowers on it, but otherwise they actually look quite the same. So what does this plant look like? Well, when we got to them, there it was in flower, and here is diapensia with its uh, flowers looking um, spectacularly larger than the leaves. And it really is a very, very pretty alpine. It's one of those that's, that's not only hard to find, but when you do find it, is well worth seeing and grows in ridiculously harsh surroundings, just on bare silicaceous rock. And one of the theories is that during the year, the high winds that are always prevalent on these mountains bring in all kinds of detritus from other places, and they get trapped in the tussocks, and they rot down, providing the nutrients for this particular plant. And this was a, the way we went down, once having found it, we went the steep way down, down to this valley all the way down, um, which was quite hard, but much easier than going the other direction. And uh, uh, eventually got down to the bottom and it was four miles along to the car park. Uh, a, a, a very, very successful day. And people have often said to me, well, would you take me up? And the answer is no. I've, I've used up all my diapensia luck for a lifetime. There's, there's very little chance indeed of me choosing the right day when the sun would be out and getting up there at the right time. We were just very, very, very lucky. So much for Scotland. When you're out actually in, in these places, um, you, can, you can often see um, alpine creatures. And the only regret I got about this is that on the times when I've seen them in uh, Scotland or Wales or wherever, I've never had my camera with me. So to give you an example, um, uh, one of the things you can often look out for is the mountain hare. Now, because of the uh, um, climate change, uh, the snow isn't lying as late as the, uh, the the hare would like. And you probably know it changes its coat to bright white. So actually, if you go in springtime, you can often find the uh, mountain hare with its winter coat on, which is going to be very bad for it because it can be easily seen by golden eagles and uh, it's one of the main foods of golden eagles. Um, but yes, I've seen those and they're, and they're huge. They're actually much bigger than our ordinary hares. Great big fluffy things. Uh, similarly, if you're very, very lucky, you might find a ptarmigan. Now the ptarmigan have a lovely white coat in, in uh, winter, uh, but in the summer, female ptarmigan are brown, but they've got chicks. Now, I don't know whether you know anything about this. They never really say this in, in the books. But ptarmigan are really like the roadrunner in the cartoons. They zoom up and over the rocks on the other side very, very quickly indeed. They're not flying. They're just running and, they, and they're away from you in a flash. But if Mrs. Ptarmigan has got chicks, uh, when we were on one of the mountains there, she stopped in front of me on top of the rock to let her, kick, tri uh, her chicks catch up. And... That was when I needed the camera because she was actually posing on top of the rocks in a Scottish mountain, framed by the snow-capped Cairngorms in the background. And it was one of the famous, it's a site that is burned onto my memory, and I just wish that at that moment I'd had my camera. But there are other calpine creatures you see much more commonly, particularly in the European areas, for instance, like the marmot, which is always coming out to find out who you are and what you're doing there. Or if you're a birder, you'll find that instead of the ordinary chuff, you can find the alpine chuff. This is a Debla Petch on the Julian Alps, which is Slovenia. And even down in um, at a relatively low alpine height of 5,000 feet or so, you can find lovely butterflies like the scarce copper, um, the hummingbird hawk moth. But that's not really an alpine, as you know, that will grow, that will fly around uh, um, at low level as well. And the black vein white, which once used to fly in Britain, but no longer does. And if you're very lucky, you might actually find the Apollo butterfly, which is a genuine mountain butterfly. And you can tell that by its lovely fur coat. And in Swiss Alps, we also found the caterpillars. Well, that's a quick stop of some of the famous planes because I reckon you've probably heard of Snowdonia and you've probably heard of Ben Laws and you may have heard of the other places you certainly have heard of the Alps but there are some wonderful places around in Europe which um, 
are not known as places that people go for alpines, but actually are worth going to. Um, and the reason why I would say this is that I think we have to address two parts of the audience. There are young, fit people in their 60s and earlier who could easily climb up Ben Laws and easily climb up um, the Snowden Mountains and whatever it is and see these things. And you should do that. And it will be hard. But to quote an, um, uh, an American president, uh, uh, president, it's not because it's easy. We go there because it's hard. And there's something really great about actually going up one of these Scottish mountains, hauling all that way up with your haversack and having your butties on the mountainside and seeing all those uh, alpines. But there's a lazier way for the old gits like me. And that is when you get into Europe, you can often drive to these high heights and walk around in rolling countryside, even though you're higher than the tops of Ben Laws. And these are some of the examples. So for instance, Gentiana acaulis, which we heard about earlier, uh, growing um, in, uh, in the North Downs, for goodness sake. But really, it is at home uh, in large numbers in the Pyrenees, Pyrenees, for example. And this is in the Andorran Pyrenees, which are not as well traveled as some of the French and Pyrenean ones, uh, the French and Spanish ones. And perhaps uh, you might be interested in finding a yellow gentian, Gentiana oshtenica. This is in the Russian Caucasus. Well, good luck with trying to get there these days. Oops, why has that come back? Um, but su what surprised me was going into some of the mountains on, in, in uh, the western part of Cyprus, um, there were some surprisingly beautiful alpines. This is Arabis purpurea in the Trudos Mountains in, in Cyprus. And on another Mediterranean island, um, if you go up at the right time of year, you can find acres and acres of anemone coronaria. And they can be blue and they can be yellow and they can be this lovely pinky purple color in the white mountains of Crete. In Andorra, again, uh, you can find uh, uh, new plants, well, plants that are probably new to you, including this one, which of course hasn't got a, um, an ordinary British name because it doesn't grow anywhere here. Um, Malopo Spermum Peloponnesiacum is a member of the APAC and it uh, grows very big and is extremely spectacular. And uh, so I had to take a picture of that, especially with the hills in the background. One of the things that people do look for in Britain um, as a, a plant to really find, uh, if you like, a very difficult alpine tick would be Arabis alpina. And I think I know more people who have failed to find that in the Coolin in Scotland than have actually found it. On the continent though, you've got a very good chance. It actually grows in all sorts of places. In, 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 in shifting gravel, just like it does in, in the Coolin, but Arabis alpina here is from Slovenia in the Julian Alps. Uh, you might be looking for lilies, in which case those two are at height in the Russian Caucasus. This is Lilium molodelphum, or tulips. And here we've got Tulipa humilis at 9,000 feet on the, in the mountains of the Turkish and Iranian border. But very often walking in these um, areas where you've parked the car not so far away, and really you've probably climbed no more than 100 or 200 feet, you can find a little patch of flowers which would um, absorb you for a good hour or two as you tried to find out exactly what they were. And in the foreground, you see you've got all kinds of orchids. There's globe flower. There is an APAC. There are all kinds of things around there to attract the attention of the keen botanist. Not only that, but in this part of the country, uh, you can look out, just gaze on a wonderful scene of uh, the mountains, the clouds, the blue sky, and the flowers in the foreground, and uh, thank your lucky stars that you can still wander around in these places, even though you're a bit of an old crop like me. Well, that's my whistle-stop tour of the Alpines of Britain, Europe, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Peter.